Okay, I'm not going to keep you very long, you'll be glad to know. It's off again. I don't want to go over the art history, you can read the book for that, but I do want to say a couple of words about the difficulties of being an artist. I think I've gone in and out of artist studios for the best part of 40 years. My wife's an artist. And the real blunt truth is that apart from a very, very small percentage of artists, the majority of really good artists work away quietly, out of attention, maybe getting by with a grant here, a grant there. They do find their own clientele, but they're very rarely valued in their own lifetime. Patrick's a very interesting example of an artist who I think, as you yourself have said, is unquestionably a major figure. But it doesn't fit in to the templates of the traditional version of the history of Irish art. Something, by the way, I'm merely beavering away at reorientating. It seems to me that far from being on the periphery, as most critics argue, Patrick is actually absolutely at the centre. Now, the other point to make about this, notions of centrality, is, I suppose, that Irish art history does a disservice to virtually every major figure it looks at, because it persists in seeing those figures purely within Ireland. Now, you've only got to look at that index of art history, the art market, to see what happens. Even the Louis Le Brocchios of this world, they don't exist outside the art market of Ireland. They're only bought largely within Ireland, because they're only viewed within Ireland. If you don't measure an artist against the best elsewhere, you cannot evaluate him. It's my central contention in the book that Patrick can stand without, frankly, any difficulty against any of the major painters that have been produced, say, since 1870. The major Impressionists, the major Post-Impressionists, and so forth. And he, he's done something which only two or three other artists this century in Ireland have managed to do. He's actually combined a wealth of influences which come from the early Renaissance and the main Renaissance paintings with what art critics love to call modernism. Now, to marry the two is a phenomenally difficult job. And, it has to be said, over two years of what I can only call sparring sessions with Patrick. Interviewing Patrick, well, you don't actually interview Patrick. What you do is you sidle up to Patrick, you fire a question in, he fires a question around you, he sidles to the left, you swiftly sidle around here, and if you're fast enough and get in quick enough, you might get an answer. He is the most... Not only the most erudite of artists I have ever met, he's the quickest on the draw as well. And all artists laugh. I mean, there's no other word for it. They basically try and steer you away from what is really important, because, of course, they want you to just look at the fripperies. The great thing about this man, and I can probably say this of maybe only three or four artists of the hundreds and hundreds that I've interviewed over the years in detail. We have had our disagreements many's the time. Not once did he ever ask me, leave that out. Not once did he ever say, I know you don't think that way, but I think this way and shouldn't be put here. He paid me the ultimate compliment of saying, you're the writer, write it. And he put no preconditions whatsoever. That's actually very rare. 
it's usually only artists who are supremely confident in themselves who can do that. The other people I would like to pay tribute to, this man over here, Martin, Four Courts Press, they commissioned 20,000 words. They ended up with the appendices with 80,000. We started at 79 pages, we moved up to 90, we moved up to 120, what is it now, Martin, 136? Oh, oh, I think. Oh, worse. It kept going up and up and up with obviously financial implications and all the rest of it. They never batted an eyelid. Not once did they say, Brian, cut it down. Okay, they did leave out the chronology, but I forgive them for that. <laughs> That, after all, was about another 30,000 words, so we, we had to go somewhere. I suppose what I want to leave you with is, if we don't celebrate those artists whom, I think the Australian art critic Robert Hughes put it beautifully when he said, you look at a painting and each day a little more leeches out at you. That's the sign of a good painting. With a bad painting, the leeching suddenly stops, and you go into reverse. I've lived with a lot of Patrick's paintings for a very long time, and I can tell you, the leeching continues to this day. We ought to really be grateful for those people who, against all the odds, he's not exactly a rich man now, is he? <laughs> against all of the odds, have survived and left us with a remarkably broad, rich, and very diversity of work. In the list of works at the end, there are over 1,200 works. And that's, frankly, scratching the surface, because I know there are lots of works he didn't keep as good a record as he thought he'd get. That 66 odd years of work is a phenomenal job. And the last thing, Picasso at the end of his life started to repeat himself and repeat himself and repeat himself. Here's a man who after 66 years is still doing things differently. That, I think, is the ultimate tribute to any artist. They keep on changing, they keep on learning. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs>